two protesters attended a public event uh, where AOC was answering questions and shouted at her uh, in the interrupting the interrupting the question response period, I suppose, pushing her on why she hasn't been more vocal about efforts to peace and why basically there has been a concession of the peace movement or any calls to end the war in Ukraine um, to the right and specifically criticizing her for voting uncritically, it seems, for these Ukraine aid packages. Congresswoman, none of this matters unless there's a nuclear war, which you voted to send arms and weapons to Ukraine. Tulsi Gabbard, she's left the Democratic Party because there are a bunch of war hawks. Okay? You originally voted, you ran as an outsider, yet you've been voting to start this war in Ukraine. You're voting to start a thermonuclear war with Russia and China. Why are you playing with the lives of American citizens? You're playing with our lives. There will be no neighbors if there's a nuclear bomb. You voted to mobilize and send money to Ukrainian Nazis. You're a coward. You're a progressive socialist. Where are you against the war mobilization? He's telling the right truth. You have done nothing. Tulsi Gabbard has shown guts where you've shown cowardice. I believed in you and you became the very thing you sought to fight against. So what do you make of that, Nathan? Well, uh, yeah, so... uh, First, they actually did a, a a good job. Usually, when you uh, when when you stand up and, and and shout at someone, you can't hear what they're saying. So they actually did a good job articulating themselves. So I actually know what their critiques are. Because uh, one of the problems when you do this a lot of times is people are like, "What is that person?" And then they just get dragged away, and nobody knows yeah. what they're. Um, well, you you know, half of that there's there's some some element of a point buried somewhere in there. I mean, some of it is. Just she said you voted to to start this war with Ukraine. I mean, I actually think the sending arms to Ukraine to me is not actually the 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 part. And in fact, that's not what Chomsky criticizes. That's not what a lot of us are on the left who are critical of uh, the Biden administration's policy have been critical of. It's not necessarily just sending arms to Ukraine. That's uh, debatable. It's the lack of any push for a diplomatic end to the war. Um, Are those related? Can you can you extricate those things from each other at the end of the day? I mean, you could be sending you could be sending arms while pushing for a diplomatic end to the war. Well, the argument that I've heard people make, um, you know, and I don't want to I don't want to put words in people's mouths, so I guess I won't say who I think I'm characterizing here. But the argument that I've heard people make is basically that it is impossible for Ukraine to defeat. Russia militarily. But that is not a thing that's going to happen. There's there's not a universe, especially since at the end of the day, Russia is a nuclear power. If it were the case that Ukraine were so well armed, so well fortified, so well supported, that it was able to push Russia out of the invaded territory, that Russia at that point would have no other recourse, as it were, but to drop a nuclear bomb, to which obviously Ukraine would have no ability to respond, except for relying on nuclear power such as ourselves to be involved. And that is what is meant when people say, by voting for weapons, you are ostensibly, in effect, voting for World War III. Right. If you're, if you're, if the strategy is we're going to give them weapons until they defeat Russia, which is why I think that's that doesn't make sense. But isn't um, that what we've been hearing from the State Department? Isn't that what Anthony yeah. Blinken and all of them have been saying yeah, over and over again? The goal totally is to weaken Russia. The goal, you know, yeah. is not That's for right. peace. No. So if that is the case, if if we have our State Department advertising that that is the goal, and then <clears> our elected <throat> officials are being asked to vote for aid that is, you know, inarguably in service of that goal, at what point do you think it's fair to say what, you know, the protesters here have said, which is that you are, in effect, voting for World War III. I don't think that it, the thing that is voting for World War III is necessarily giving any arms to Ukraine. It's the failure to condition the uh, the provision of arms with the demand that Ukraine and come to the negotiating table, which obviously the Ukrainians have now ruled out uh, coming to the negotiating table. So uh, it's fine to provide them with defense. Not every provision of weapons necessarily is it, it has to be 
is part of a strategy to have them completely defeat Russia and take back Crimea. You could carefully calculate defensive weapons to try and expel Russia from portions of Ukrainian territory that it has invaded over the last six months. Yeah, I, I could see that. But what I, I guess what I'm saying is that that is not America's posture. And knowing that that's not America's posture, voting for America to send arms without the goal of reaching peace is enabling that march toward World War III, is it not? I, I'm not. I'm just. I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just. I'm just trying to. Because I heard this criticism a lot. Of, a lot in the in the past few days, where people say this is a kind of hyperbolic charge they're putting to AOC. And I think we definitely can have a conversation about whether or not it was, and you know, it was the right to frame it that way in terms of getting people to listen to them and understand what they were saying. However, I'm just trying to like when you pre press down on it, it's hard for me to understand why, even if that's not what AOC's goal is in her heart or any of these progressives' goals are in their heart. If you know that, as was reported, you know, earlier this year, that America has, uh, uh, you know, repeatedly thwarted attempts at peace talks and that its stated goal is to weaken Russia, then how can you go ahead and vote for aid knowing that you are complicit in that goal? Well, I, I mean, I, because the aid can be justified independently. Like, I think you can say, like, I believe in helping a a country that is being invaded repel that invasion. Um, and the, I'm going to support, I'm not going to withhold support for the country just because U.S. policy is actually calculated towards something else that is very bad and dangerous. Um, I'm not going to, you know, weaken Ukraine's ability to fight off Russian aggression because I oppose United States policy. Um, but... That I think where the criticism of AOC is completely valid, completely valid, and where I'm glad that people on the left would criticize her, is to say, where are you in criticizing U.S. policy? Okay, you can just, maybe you can justify voting to send weapons to Ukraine to repel the Russian invasion. What you cannot justify is complete silence on the U.S. refusal to try and negotiate a diplomatic end to the war. I think that is indefensible. And so, you know, I'm quibbling here with, with the protesters for focusing narrowly on the kind of arguable thing, which is the vote to send weapons, versus the thing that I think is totally not arguable, which is clearly in the wrong, which is not speaking up against the existing United States policy on Ukraine. I, I think I'm a, little, I'm a little mixed on that. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I can... I. I think the problem is that sometimes when you when you when you charge folks with not talking about something enough, I mean, frankly, this is kind of what <laughs> this is kind of what in a very different subject, but also a newsy subject this week. Um, uh, what's your face? The comedian uh, Sarah Silverman. Sorry, this is what Sarah Silverman kind of got in trouble for tweeting the other day. She says, why? Why is it only Jewish people who are calling out anti-Semitism when it happens? She was specifically talking about the Kanye West tweets, you know, tweet and video and all the things. And a bunch of people responded, well, we do say this. We do say this. And that's that's the problem. When you charge someone with, why doesn't anybody ever talk about this? There's always somebody who's talking about it. And it's very easy to make the case that the charge is in bad faith, that the criticism is in bad faith, because you're always going to find be able to find a counterexample. And especially when you're talking about someone like AOC, who has so much kind of broad liberal goodwill attached to her um, and who is kind of in this interesting space in the public sphere where she has, I think, arguably more support from the mainstream Democrats than a good chunk of the left. Not all of the left, obviously. A lot of the left is still very enthusiastic about her. But, you know, this shift is happening where she's been embraced more tightly, I think, almost by the mainstream than the left. And so you're going to get in a place where it seems like you're being unfair. You're just haranguing this woman who gets a lot of harassment, like legitimately so, from people who are not making arguments against her in bad faith. And so there's something specific about the charge about her votes, which are uncontroversial. You know, you voted sure, for this but I, aid. But I think the vote can be justified, right? So like if we took if we took World War II and we said like the United States policy towards Japan of demanding unconditional surrender and dropping atomic bombs was a hideous policy, right? I, I, I mean, I think it's totally indefensible. I think a lot of what the United States did in the uh, bombings of, of Germany and Japan were, just t were utterly indefensible from a winning the war perspective. If I was in Congress, however, and I'm faced with, do I vote to continue funding World War II or not? 
I think it is arguable whether your job is to, to like vote against continuing to fund the U.S. war effort in World War II, or whether your job is to staunchly critique and demand changes to that policy, even as you say, well, I'm not going to vote to like cut off arms to the U.S. forces in the Pacific and in Europe. So I think the vote on arms is debatable. But I don't think she has said anything critiquing the Biden administration's incredibly uh, dangerous refusal to push the parties toward negotiations in, in Ukraine. And I think that's not a bad faith criticism. It's a real criticism of things she hasn't done or said. Well, what, what some people say when the World War II example is raised is that a reality that exists now that didn't exist then is that the opponent has nuclear capabilities now. So if you said in a World War II context, you know, we're going to fight this in war to the bitter end, the obvious human life lost, the, the toll, the genocide that's going on requires us to fight until our last resource is exhausted. That looks slightly different in a world without the potential of nuclear holocaust, nuclear fallout, than a world with one. And, you know, I mean, how do you how do you reckon with that? That if, even if even, you know, this isn't this isn't a genocide that's, ha you know, this isn't this isn't World War Two. This isn't a Holocaust that's occurring right now. But whether or not the fact of it at the end game being potential world obliteration, does that change at all the calculus or how we come to think about what our role in this should be as a nuclear power? Yeah, because we should be incredibly, incredibly careful, which uh, I don't think, which uh, the, and this is why that so much of the rhetoric that we hear is completely and utterly irresponsible, where people are like, Putin must be defeated at all costs. And it's like, well, okay, but uh, at all costs? <laughs> at all costs? <laughs> at the cost of, as Joe Biden has now specifically said, we are risking Armageddon? Is that a cost we're willing to uh, to risk? I'm not. I would. I don't think a lot of other people are. So yeah, no, absolutely. The fact that the stakes are so so high in this um, should really make us a lot more cautious about this. Rah rah. We want Ukraine to just defeat Russia and crush Russia and weaken Russia and make sure Russia should never ever do this again. It's like, okay, well, yes, we all want that, uh, but we're also dealing with a, a nuclear armed state that can annihilate the entire United States if this madman who's in charge of the country suddenly uh, goes over the edge. So what do you make then of someone like Mehdi Hassan who weighed in saying, quote, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen, screaming hysterically about opposing war while praising Tulsi Gabbard, avoiding any mention of Vladimir Putin and blaming dot, 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 AOC. Embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't care that much for Tulsi Gabbard. Um, I'm not a, not a big Tulsi Gabbard fan, and I think that the repeated invocations of Tulsi Gabbard are not sort of distracted from the, from the message there. I, I I think it's fair to criticize and protest AOC. I think you also need to protest a lot of other people because the fact is she's usually the least worst of the people in Congress. Um, well, I will but... say this: the same um, the same guy, uh, Jose Vega, who protested AOC here, also protesting Jamal Bowman uh, last week, confronting him on similar subjects, and Jamal Bowman basically responded, "Hey, I respect you, free speech." You know, free speech, I'll talk to you after. We could do more on climate. We could do more on lowering prescription drug costs. We could do more on gun control. We could do more with regard to the black agenda. We can do more. Congressman, and you're a hypocrite because you are funding neo-Nazis in Ukraine. They are wearing the Ukrainian, they are wearing the black sun symbol. The same symbol that the Buffalo shooter used. The same symbol that the guy, that the person who almost killed the vice president in Argentina used. Thank you, you so much. You say you want to advance the black cause, but you are funding the same people who you, who kill in the name of white supremacy. This okay, is the this is the, the foundation. For the Bronx. This is oh, the foundation of our democracy, God. freedom of speech. If you choose to fund. Nazis Stick around and I will have a conversation with you right after the end. But let me get to the conclusion. Stick around. I promise. I got you. The foundation of our democracy is freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. 
So we appreciate that, and, and brother, I will talk to you at the end. And apparently when he talked to him after, and people should go and listen to the Revolutionary Blackout Network, had Jose on in, uh, the other day and interviewed him about that experience. He didn't really have much of substance to say. And basically it was the kind of answer that, of course, he wanted to give in private. That's how it was characterized by them, at least, because it was so empty. And so so that's all to say that, this, that there is some consistency here. It's not just that AOC is, is coming under focus. Well, uh, he's going after Jamal Bowman is also a DSA member. So, you know, uh, we're going after the left here or the least worst people. Right. You've also got to protest Pelosi and Biden. Like the biggest, the worst offender here is Joe Biden and the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken and all the people from the blob. Um, the, the U.S. foreign policy establishment are the are the real worst offenders here. And the, the, the kind of irony is that AOC gets more flack because she's better. It's like, because we expect well, more yeah, but Nathan, the expectations. It, exactly. Are isn't it, isn't it the case that like, you know, that Joe Biden isn't going to start, you know, there are reasons, there are structural reasons why Joe Biden has the posture to this conflict that he does. It's yeah. not that he's just ignorant. So it, it doesn't, it make sense to ask the people who have at least articulated that they share your politics with respect to foreign intervention and America's role overseas as the America's police person to 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 ask them, demand for them to at least stand by their stated principles. Doesn't that make more sense than banging your head against the brick wall of Nancy Pelosi's office? Yeah, maybe. Although when the Bush administration went to war in Iraq, we were all out protesting George W. Bush. Maybe we should have been protesting Joe Biden as well. But, it, you know, it was Bush's war. Did, um, did, did and- we have people in office at the time? I'm, I'm asking this genuinely, that we felt like, really were anti-war and weren't standing up and speaking out the way they should have been doing at the time. Yeah. And I, th- I actually think there is a reasonable argument that uh, some of the a greater focus should have been on Democrats who were complicit in mm-hmm. that war um, and that there was too much focus on George W. Bush without uh, and, and which allowed a lot of the Democrats who, you know, were totally on board. And Joe Biden, of course, helped ju- com- construct the justification for that war. And Hillary Clinton helped construct the justification of that war. And yet we weren't really going after them because Bush mm-hmm. was uh, Bush was so terrible. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, so, but, but here, here's the thing. Medi, who I hope comes on this show today, I haven't actually asked him explicitly. I don't want that to be like weird subtext, but you know, who I was, you know, had a great time working with at The Intercept. You know, I think despite, I think some really legitimate criticisms of his coverage is one of the better left voices on mainstream media for what it's worth. Weighs in, giving absolutely no, no airing to the substantive critique here and basically focuses in on the fact that Tulsi Gabbard is raised as a better alternative. And I've been really struggling with this because Tulsi is obviously a polarizing figure. I think that she has been very inconsistent with her anti-war stances. I think that she has obviously maintained her status as a um, reserve uh, member uh, and was gone for a few months and said on social media, sorry, I've been away. I've been doing AFRICOM, you know, like she, she, she dips her toe in. She, she has supported droning people on the left have been in the last few days since she's announced that she's left the democratic party, have been making all of the criticisms of Tulsi Gabbard, which I think are true. I think it's also true that because of the failure of leftists to say absolutely anything at all about this incident in particular, it doesn't take much to get to the left of them in this instance. And it it is troubling because I watched, maybe we should pull this up, Armand. I watched a radar for a, a, like a monologue, a short, like three minute monologue from Jesse Waters last night. And I had a hard time. It was about this AOC Michigas. And I had a hard time finding the lie in what he said, not because Tulsi Gabbard is so great or because the right is so great on these anti-war issues, but because of the very, very, very small number of voices that are actually anti-war in this moment, zero of them are on the left in terms of elected officials. She's becoming everything she sought to fight against. And there was a time not too long ago where AOC hated war. She was against the Iraq war, obviously. She hammered Trump for killing Soleimani, called that an act of war, even opposed eradicating ISIS. But now, all of a sudden, she wants to arm Ukraine to the teeth to fight a war. She calls it her moral obligation to wage a proxy war. 
And she sure means it. She's voted all three times to send over $65 billion to Ukraine. So where did this side of AOC come from? Maybe she can explain herself. Why not right now? I'm not going to answer your questions because you're so rude. Well, to quote AOC directly, the whole point of protesting is to make people feel uncomfortable. And judging by how AOC reacted to these hecklers, I'd say their protest was quite effective. So I, when he tees up, she's been anti-war. These are the positions she's taken in the past. What happened to that AOC? Oh, she says it's because there's rudeness. Then you go to that very famous tweet where she, you know, defended a kind of agitated, more adversarial protest style saying it's supposed to make you uncomfortable. How do you square all of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think she'd be a hypocrite if she said uh, that she didn't want uh, anyone to protest, if she started hauling away protesters from her. Uh, I don't know if they were dragged out or, or whatever. Um, I, Yeah, obviously you should get to go and shout at your elected representative. It's one of the great rights that we have as Americans is to point at the people we voted for and say and tell them how terrible they are. Um so when she says it's rude, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's that's the point, isn't it? Um, but uh, is she a hawk? I don't know that she's a hawk. There's there's uh, there seems to be a difference between. I haven't heard hawkish rhetoric necessarily. Well, sure. From Let, her. Let's say that that's hyperbole, hyperbole, hyperbole on the part of the Fox News guy doing his entertainment shtick. Okay, she's obviously not a, a war hawk. But at, at what point is this just like a, a, a semantic? exchange we're having here. And at what point, look, here, here, here's what I'm getting at. I think that people are obviously made uncomfortable by the idea that Tulsi Gabbard, given the inconsistencies of her record, gets to be put on a pedestal in this instance. However, it seems to me that the ability to do that in a way that frankly does empower Tulsi Gabbard and whatever her political project ends up being, she's only able to do that because of the, yes, I believe cowardice of the progressives in the House who have let it be the case that the only people who voted against the Ukraine funding, where I think 57 Republicans in the House and 11 Republicans in the Senate. Zero Democrats, including all of these progressives who are supposed to be our best and brightest. As I say, I don't know that the problem is voting for the Ukraine funding. Um, I, I, I think, it, I, I mean, I honestly think you could vote to arm Ukraine and that be consistent. I think you could have voted to arm the Iraqi resistance against the United States and that would also have been uh, justified. I think giving arms to a, a power defending itself against aggression can be justified. And I don't know that Republicans are, are, are voting against it because they have an anti-war stance or rather because they just don't really care about people in other countries. And they, but, uh, but Nathan, you know that that's never been... This is not, I don't think that either side is especially invested in the lives and well-being of Ukrainians, I got to say. But I don't think that that's the case ever in any war that the United States selectively chooses to enter. I mean, the, the critique from the beginning of this thing hasn't been whether it's like meritorious, whether the Ukrainians' claims are meritorious or whether or not they deserve to be able to not be invaded. You know, that that's never been the question. The question that I think folks have very immediately raised on the left was, why this conflict? Why are we who I feel like I feel like sometimes I got to like shake people in this conversation and remind everybody that like we are not we're not in fact Ukraine. Like we are in fact another country on the other side of the world that picks and chooses and doesn't get involved in the majority of crises that are ongoing on this very big planet with 7 billion people on it. So why this one? What is our interest? And the interest has nothing to do with humanitarian things, because for the money, for $80 billion, you could buy a mosquito net <laughs> for every person who needs one and, and cure, you know, in, in the transmission of HIV and do a lot of other things, probably. But we're not on that. We're not on that tip. It's not about life for life. Right. Well, I, uh, yeah, I think it's perfectly fine to point out the hypocrisy. I think uh, why why do you support Ukra uh, Ukrainian resistance to Russian aggression, but you don't support Palestinian, you don't support arming the Palestinians. <laughs> right. Like nobody, nobody in U.S. politics supports arming the Palestinians, and of course, we were out <laughs> arming Saudi Arabia um, in its uh, in its hideous war in Yemen. Um, <laughs> when we, should, you know, nobody supported arming the other other side. Yeah, that's that's a perfectly reasonable. Right, and, point. and we are only now talking about ceasing those arms sales to Saudi Arabia because we're so pissed off about them raising the cost of oil. 
before midterms. <laughs> not killing a journalist, not any of that other stuff, but it's always this financial tether, right? Uh, yeah, but a, a principal person could say that I do believe in arming the Palestinians. And I also believe that when Ukraine uh, requests uh, assistance from the United States after uh, having been invaded, uh, it's reasonable to give them defensive assistance to repel an invasion of their country. Uh, but you got to be consistent. So you either do both or you do neither. <laughs> the problem is people doing one. Right. And the problem is also, I think, that they are they are not at all speaking out. And Bernie is in this as well. Like I agree. Th- I agree. Complete and total radio silence. So I want to I want to I want to move to the other the other protest event uh, of the day before we run out of time. But it, it is also worth ref- uh, m- mentioning that this is the kind of thing you mentioned earlier. Like AOC gets undue focus, and I think oftentimes that is true. But I think some of that is because she participates on social media in a way that exposes her to a level of criticism that some of the other squad members don't do. So. AOC responded to Mehdi Hassan saying on Twitter, saying the worst part, which of course they cut from the clip, is the fact that they were yelling over a asterisk emphasis, deaf constituent asking a question and continued to do so when it was made clear to them that they were yelling over a person with a disability. Now, if you read that tweet, you might think, oh my goodness, there was literally a, a, a deaf person who was you know, signing at the front of the room or, or asking a question in the front of the room overcoming that communication barrier and someone's shouting over them, wow, that's really impolite. When RBN did the good work of actually interviewing um, Jose, and I think you can see this now in the longer streams that have been put up, there was no deaf person in the room. They were reading an email from a deaf constituent. All the questions were coming in via email. So now AOC looks like she's, she's trying to weaponize the idea of yelling over a disabled person to yeah. shame shame the protesters instead of just engaging yeah. with them on yeah. the merit of what they were protesting about. I mean, look, what are we supposed to do with that? Like, I, I think I have been very measured in my criticism of AOC, but she sure. she sticks her neck out like this on stuff like this, <laughs> and it's 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 so cringe. It's so embarrassing. It's uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think there are plenty of legitimate reasons to 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 criticize AOC. Yeah, I just think the the thing that I always think needs to be borne in mind is that if you look at voting records, she probably has the least worst of anyone in Congress. So we should just be a little careful of the dynamic whereby we leftists tend to tear down the person who is the closest to agreeing with us. Right. I, I guess I don't I don't see it as tearing her down. I see it as she's literally the last hope. I mean, if you want people to be invested in electoralism, if you want people to go to the ballot box, midterms are coming up. If this is our the best we got, and she's out here lying at worst, stretching the truth at best to defend herself from some legitimate criticisms, even if you think they're mixed in with some illegitimate ones, Tulsi, blah, 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 whatever your hangup is, about the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine and the exponentially greater chance we now live in of a nuclear war then it, I, I'm sorry, you don't have much of an argument about getting people to the poll. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith. Thank you.